Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, uh, this is basically a part two to the last video, but you don't have to have watched the last video to uh, get this one, okay? In the last video, we were talking about the book of Revelation and where it talks about the river Euphrates and the bottomless pit and Armageddon and how all those things are tied together. Um, so if you missed that, go check it out, but you don't have to have watched that to understand this one. In this video, we're going to be talking about uh, essentially uh, the terms fallen ones, Nephilim, and the Watchers. And these are terms that can be found in the book of Enoch, as well as other places too. And uh, my goal here is to do a deep dive and kind of sort these out and um, compare and contrast these to <clears throat> church doctrine. So I got this email from uh, Rebecca Balzer, and she was telling me about, because like she made a comment and I wanted her to send me additional information. So she, she sent me an email that has to do with something that she saw. This is the title <clears throat> of the video that she saw on Facebook. Are the fallen angels returning? Terrifying sounds coming out of the ground of the Euphrates River. Okay, so I, I don't know. And to be fair, I'm not going to put words in her mouth. I don't know if she's like referring to um, the Watchers out of the Book of Enoch or or Nephilim or I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. So, and this isn't meant to embarrass anybody or offend anyone because I know there's a lot of members of the church that have kind of taken an interest to in these things. Uh, I myself, the first time that I came across it, across like Nephilim, the term Nephilim, uh, was probably about two years ago as I was watching other um, like non-LDS uh, channels that, that are watching for the signs of the times and talking about the second coming. Uh, one thing that evangelicals are really interested in. And when I say evangelicals, I'm talking about the ones that are interested in the second coming. One thing that they're very, or <clears throat> there's a few things that I've noticed they're very, very interested in. <clears throat> Probably the most taught, the most favorite thing that they like to talk about is the rapture, uh, which, you know, we have that concept too. We don't call it rapture. That's more of a term from, from uh, those other churches. We would think of it as being caught up when Christ comes, uh, being quickened, translated. Um, they're also really big into the Antichrist. Now, I've not seen anything in our doctrine to substantiate a single person, one big bad Antichrist that has to appear before the second coming. Uh, before you tell me to read the scriptures, I, I've read them, okay? I have an entire playlist about the Antichrist, and so just go check that out. It's not the, the point of this video. And then uh, the other thing is they like to use the Book of Enoch a lot, and um, uh, which is interesting because they don't um, <clears throat> ever consider the Book of Mormon, but they're willing to go to the Book of Enoch. And uh, it, it kind of like introduces some pretty interesting concepts, including the Nephilim. Or at least like it expands on those concepts quite a bit. So let's uh, let's jump into it now. Here's the video uh, or a video that I found. It's not the same one as what she watched, where he has some recordings of those sounds that are coming from the uh, Euphrates River. Which I, I don't know if it's like true or not, but uh, you can check this, this out. Decide for yourself. Um, so I wanted to do just a review of what we believe as a church, um, according to church doctrine. When it comes to angels, demons, devils, you know, so on and so forth. Um, okay, first, let's read about devils, okay? Uh, this is spoken about in a few different places in the book Mormon Doctrine. That's what we're looking at, Mormon Doctrine by Bruce R. McConkie. But this is... this. Entry right here for devils is probably the, the, the best one to read. So it says, see demons, devil, uh, evil spirits, false spirits, pre-existence, prince of devils, sons of Belial, sons of perdition. Okay. All, all of those, which all those words I do not like to say, by the way, I'm not a big fan. But anyway, it says devils are the spirit beings who followed Lucifer in his war of rebellion 
in the pre-existence. Okay. So this is already different right here from the way that other churches view Satan and angels, because my understanding from everything that I've learned throughout my life is that, um, and I don't know if there's like variations between Christianity, Judaism, Islam, when it comes to angels and demons, but um, <clears throat> it seems like the prevailing idea is that you have God that's at the very top. He's um, without form. Uh, he's omnipresent, uh, omnipotent, um, and uh, omniscient. And he created essentially like a workforce uh, that's called angels. And they, they do the work of God. And um, so they're, they're heavenly creatures. And then below that, he created man. And man is like a, an earthly creature. So <clears throat> in other religions, they, they differentiate between angels and human beings, uh, which is different from the way that we view it, right? We know that um, Satan, his followers, us, the prophets, um, all the angels that have ever been, Christ, the Holy Ghost, we're all on the same level as far as being spirit children of Heavenly Father. Okay. Heavenly Father, he created all of us. We are his sons and da daughters, um, all of those. So we're, we're all in the same generation. Okay. <clears throat> so that, that's important to understand. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, now with one, with one notable exception, um, wait, let me, let me show you this. Okay. This is found in the te the scriptural teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, which you can find this on the scripture citation index by BYU. And I wanted to show you something interesting. Uh, this is just a little tangent, but we'll, we'll get back to it. In the Bible, you have um, different beasts that show up, right? Uh, particularly in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Uh, sometimes this confuses people. Um, in Daniel, you have four beasts that represent uh, the earthly powers from Babylon to the Persian Midians to the Macedonians and then to the Romans, right? So they represent empires. And then in Revelation, there's another four beasts, but they're actually combined. It's, it's the same four, but they're combined into one beast. So those are figurative. They represent earthly kingdoms, including the horns and stuff like that. Now, in the book of Revelation, in another place, it talks about how uh, John is having a vision and he sees four beasts and 24 elders. That's separate from those other beasts. And this is what Joseph Smith says. Uh, the prophets do not declare that they saw a beast, a beast or beasts, but that they saw the image or figure of a beast. Daniel did not see an actual bear or a lion, but the image, the images or figures of those beasts. The translation should have been rendered image instead of beast. In every instance where beasts are mentioned by the prophets. But John saw the actual beast in heaven showing that John <clears throat> showing to John that beast did actually exist there not to represent figures of things on the earth when the prophets speak of seeing beasts in their visions they mean that they saw the images they uh, they being types of, to represent certain things at the same time they received the interpretation as to what those images or types uh, were designed to represent so, in other words, because there's no interpretation of the four beasts along with the 24 elders, they are actual heaven, heavenly beings of some kind. Okay. Uh, I think he says more about it here. John saw curious looking beasts in heaven. He saw every creature that was in heaven, all the beasts, fowls, and fish in heaven. 
uh, actually they are giving glory to God. How do you prove it? Quote, and every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessed and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Uh, varied creatures in heaven. <clears throat> I suppose John saw beings there of a thousand forms that had been saved from the 10,000 times 10,000 earths like this. Strange beasts of which we have no conception. Uh, all might be seen in heaven. The grand secret was to show John that there was in heaven, what, what there was in heaven. John learned that God glorified himself by saving all that his hands had made, whether beasts, fowls, fishes, or men, and he will glorify himself with them. Okay, so th this is the end of the tangent. Basically, there are beasts there, but they don't act as like angels that come to earth, like when we think of angels. Um, it does seem like animals possess a higher ability to communicate. Um, there's some stories in the scriptures um, of animals talking. So anyway, I just wanted to show you this one exception, but let's go back to to uh, Mormon doctrine. Okay, so let's start with devils. Okay, so they are the spirit beings who followed Lucifer in his war of rebellion in the pre-existence. They comprise one third of those spirit children of the father who were destined to pass through a mortal probation on this earth. They were cast down to earth and have been forever denied physical bodies. So that that's one of the important things to remember about them is that they have not received physical bodies. And that's going to be key as we explore the concept of the Nephilim. Um, a fact which causes them to seek habitation in the bodies of other persons. Uh, by the power of faith and the authority of the priesthood, devils are frequently cast out of such afflicted persons. Now, that's something that can happen. And my understanding is that that does not happen unless you allow it. Because anyone that has a body has more power over somebody that does not have a body. And um, they cannot just, like, injure you. You have to be living in such a way that you allow them to. Okay, as followers of Satan, who is perdition, they are sons of perdition, they are demons, angels of the devil, his evil ministers and servants, their ultimate destiny, destiny is to go away into everlasting fire where, quote, their torment is as a lake of fire and brimstone, whose flame ascendeth up forever and ever and has no end. Okay, so that, um, that is what we understand and has been revealed to us when it comes to <clears throat> the devil and demons. They're they're just they're just people that chose not to come to this earth, and uh, they're they're causing all sorts of problems. Um, <clears throat> now, when it comes to angels, okay, um, remember other Christian churches would view the devil as a fallen angel, and we view it the same way, but not the same way that they do, because again. We view all these beings as being our brothers and sisters. So you have the devil and his followers. They're our brothers and sisters. Uh, if there are females among them, I don't know. And then you have um, good angels, which could be, for example, someone that has not been born yet. That appears like someone that's still in the pre-existence. I'd have to think if that's ever happened, except for when um the savior has appeared uh because he he wasn't appearing as an as an angel but i'm not sure if it's happened before where someone has appeared from the pre-existence except for the savior um if you can think of any story put it in the comment below in the comments below you can have somebody that has lived in this life and then passed away and is now a spirit again but has not been resurrected yet uh, such was the case with Gabriel. We know that the angel Gabriel is Noah. So Noah had died, but then he appeared after his death, uh, but before he was resurrected. So that's another instance where there's an, a, a type of angel, I guess you could say. And then you have resurrected beings, such as the angel Moroni, that are now in a resurrected state. So those are like the three 
possibilities essentially when it comes to angels but they're still they're not separate from us they're not separate creatures they are our brothers and sisters okay so all on the same uh in the same generation that's that's what it is okay now i hope i have this in an an order that makes sense i this one was kind of hard to put together okay nephilim Okay, this might be new to you. I may not. It says, <clears throat> Jewish explanations interpret them as hybrid sons of fallen angels. Okay, hybrid sons of fallen angels. Now, you can probably see here how that's that's in conflict with our doctrine, because since the fallen angels are Satan and his followers, they do not have bodies with which to create hybrids. Okay. In other religions, no problem because angels are separate creatures that uh, presumably, I don't know their theology very well, but presumably do have bodies with which they could have offspring. Right. So anyway, uh, the main reference to them is in Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. But the passage is ambiguous, and the identity of the Nephilim is disputed. Okay, Again, the Nephilim are supposed to be hybrids, where their father is a fallen angel, and their mother is a human female. That's what a Nephilim is. Nephilim is plural. So I don't know what the singular is, but plural is Nephilim. According to the book of Numbers 13.33, they later inhabit Canaan at the time of the Israelite conquest of Canaan. A similar or identical biblical Hebrew term read as Nephilim by some scholars, or as the word fallen by others, appears in the book of Ezekiel 32.27. And then it's also in these um, apocryphal books right here. So let's go to Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Here it is. And it came to pass that, that when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God... Okay, the sons of God. This is this is a key term here. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be in hundred and twenty years. There were giants. Okay. That was something I skipped over here. Uh, The word Nephilim is loosely translated as giants in some translations of the Hebrew Bible, but left untranslated in others. Okay, so giants or Nephilim. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, were the sons of God come in unto the daughters of men and they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old uh, men of renown. Okay. Let's read the next one. Or wait, maybe not. I can't remember why. It doesn't matter. Um, Wait. Oh, yeah, because it explains it right here. So before we get into some of the interpretation the from our church of these things. I want to read just a little bit more about Nephilim and the fallen ones and so on and so forth. Um, okay, the Hebrew Nephilim literally means the fallen ones. And the strict translation into Greek would be peptokotes, which is which in fact appears in the Septuagint of Ezekiel 32 verses 22 through 27. 
It seems then that the authors of the Septuagint wished only wished not only to simply translate the foreign term into Greek, but also to employ a term which would be intelligible and meaningful for their Hellenistic audi audiences. Okay. So literally, it means the fallen ones. That that's Nephilim. Now, again, the Nephilim, according to this, okay, according to the Book of Enoch, is they are the offspring of the fallen ones, fallen angels. They are hybrids between they're human angel hybrids, Nephilim. But Nephilim also translates to the fallen ones. Okay, fallen angels. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, wish I could not have that picture right there, but whatever. Okay, all all early sources refer to the sons of heaven, quote unquote, as angels. So we just read that uh, in the King James. It says sons of God. Okay, but from the third from the third century BC onwards. References are found in the book in the Enochic literature, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Jubilees, the Testament of Reuben, Second Baruch, Josephus, and the Book of Jude. For example, in First Enoch chapter seven verse two, quote, "And when the angels, the sons of heaven, beheld them, they became enamored of them." saying to each other, Come, let us select for ourselves wives from the progeny of men, and let us beget children. End quote. Some Christian apologists, such as uh, Tertullian, and especially Lacantius, share this opinion. Okay. Is there anything else here? No. Okay, now let's go to the book of Enoch. Just read a few more things. Find the highlights content. Uh, the first part of the Book of Enoch describes the fall of the Watchers, who are the angels who fathered the angel-human hybrids called Nephilim. So the fallen angels were called the Watchers. Okay, the Watchers. So they are the same as fallen angels, and they um, fathered the Nephilim, according to this. All right. Now, this article is about the Book of Enoch. I thought it'd be worth reading this right here. This is like different um, receptions by different churches to uh, the Book of Enoch. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS Church, the largest denomination within the Latter-day Saint movement, does not consider First Enoch to be part of its standard canon, although it believes that a purported quote-unquote original Book of Enoch uh, was an inspired book. The Book of Mo Moses, first published in the 1830s, is part of the scriptural canon of the LDS Church and has a section which claims to contain extracts from the original Book of Enoch. This section has many similarities to First Enoch and other Enoch texts, including Second Enoch, Third Enoch, and the Book of Giants. The Enoch section of the Book of Moses is believed by the church to contain extracts from, quote, the ministry, teachings, and visions of Enoch, end quote, though it does not contain the entire Book of Enoch itself. The LDS Church would therefore consider the portions of the other texts which match its Enoch excerpts to be inspired while not rejecting but withholding judgment on the remainder. Okay. If you go to the Bible Dictionary um, and you look up Apocrypha, it says here, uh, that, okay, so Apocrypha is secret or hidden. By this word is generally meant those sacred books of the Jewish people that were not included in the, in the Hebrew Bible. They are valuable as forming a link connecting the Old and New Testaments and are regarded in the church as useful reading, although not all the books are of equal value. 
Okay, not all the books are of equal value. Uh, they are the subject of a revelation recorded in DNC uh, section 91, in which it's stated that the contents are mostly correct, but with many interpolations by man. Among these books, the following are of special value. The book of first Asedris, the book of Ased, the second book of Asedris, the book of Tobit or Tobit, the book of Judith, the rest of the chapters of the book of, of Esther, the book of the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of Jesus, the son of Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, um, the book of Baruch, the song of the three children, the history of Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, the Prayer of Manassas, the first book of the Maccabees, the second book of the Maccabees. Okay, so those are the ones, what I just said, that the Bible dictionary says are of special value. Okay, later, after it lists those, it says, besides these books, uh, there are other Jewish apocryphal writings. The chief are the Psalms of Solomon, the Book of Enoch, the Apocalypse of Baruch, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Assumption, yeah, the Assumption of Moses, the Book of Jubilees, and the Sibylline Oracles. So, what I take from this is that the Book of Enoch seems to be, um, from our church's point of view, of lesser value because it says here, not all the books are of equal value, and then it details the one the ones that are special value and then it lists the rest of them of which is the book of enoch so we should keep that in mind and um again we should keep in mind that there's kind of a problem when it comes to how we view fallen angels compared to how the rest of christianity views fallen angels because they view them as creatures that are capable of procreation uh whereas we do not because we know that it's Satan and his followers that do not have bodies <clears throat> and therefore cannot uh, procreate. Um, okay, is that it? Okay, there's some more. Uh, the first section of the book uh, depicts the interaction of the fallen angels with mankind. Sorry, let me clear my throat. <clears> throat> uh, Semia Zaz uh, compels the other 199 fallen angels to take human wives to quote unquote beget us children and some jaza who was their leader said unto them quote i fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed and i alone shall have to pray to pay the penalty for of a great sin end quote and they all answered him and said quote let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan but to do this thing end quote then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it and they were in all 200 who descended in the days of jared on the summit the summit of mount hermon and they called it mount hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it uh, the names of the leaders are given as Samyaza, uh, their leader, uh, their leader, Arakiel, Rameiel, Kokabiel. Okay, I'm not going to read them all. Uh, this results in the creation of the Nephilim uh, in Genesis, or Anakim, or Anak, giants, as they are described in the in the book. Quote. And they became pregnant, and they bare great giants, whose height was 300 L's, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. So that's pretty awful. And then there's some more. Uh, God commands Raphael to imprison Azazel. The Lord said to Raphael, quote, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and and make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudael, 
um, and cast him therein and place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him, cover him with darkness and let him abide there forever and cover his face that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire and heal the earth with the angels, which the angels have corrupted and proclaim the healing of the earth that they may heal the plague in that all children of men may not perish through all the secret things which the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. And the whole earth has become corrupt through the works uh, that were taught by Azazel. To him ascribe all sin. And then after that, it says, God gave Gabriel instructions concerning the Nephilim in the imprisonment of the fallen angels. Quote, And Gabriel said to the Lord, Proceed against the biters and the reprobates and against the children of fornication and destroy the children of fornication and the children of the watchers from amongst men and cause them to go forth. Send them one against another uh, that they may destroy each other in battle. Okay, so this is um, wildly different from uh, from our doctrine, essentially. Um let me show you let me show you a couple of things. Let's go to the uh, student manual, the Institute student manual for the Old Testament. And let's read what it says about the sons of God and the daughters of men. Moses, sorry, <clears throat> Moses chapter eight, verses thirteen to sixteen. Let me make sure that's where I'm supposed to start. Yeah, okay further clarifies what is meant here and why the inner marriage is condemned. Commenting on the same verses, Elder Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, quote, Because the daughters of Noah married the sons of men contrary to the teachings of the Lord, his anger was kindled, and this offense was, was one cause that brought to pass the universal flood. You will see that the conditions the condition appears reversed in the book of Moses. It was the daughters of the sons of God who were marrying the sons of men, uh, which was displeasing unto the Lord. So here it's reverse, and here it seems like it's not referring to fallen angels. Okay, let me let me read it again. Okay, because the daughters of Noah, in fact, maybe we should read. The actual verses. So first we got Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 2 and then verse 21. And it came to pass that when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God, which the other religions would say those are the fallen angels or the watchers before they become fallen, I guess, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all that, all which they chose. In verse 21, And take thou unto thee of all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Now, let's read Moses. This is uh, scripture unique to our church. Moses chapter 8, verses 13 to 16. And Noah and his sons hearkened unto the Lord, and gave heed, and they were called the sons of God. Okay, now look at that. It defines what that means, the sons of God. The other religions, they view that as the angels. But in Moses, we learn Noah and his sons were called the sons of God. Okay, Noah and his sons are the sons of God, not watchers. And when these men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of men saw that the daughters were fair. Oh, okay. So see, the sons of men, not, not the sons of God, which would be Noah and his, his it says right here, and his sons hearkened unto the Lord. So it's like, if you're a son of God, you are hearkening to the Lord, see, and gave heed, and they were called sons of God. So you have a, a difference between the sons of God who give heed and then everybody else, which would be men, okay? So when these men, meaning the son, sons of God, 
began to multiply in, uh, on the face. Well, no, I guess that would mean all of them probably. And when these men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, the sons of men saw that those daughters were fair. So the, the worldly men saw that the, the daughters of the covenant or the daughters of God, you could say, were fair. And they took them wives, even as they chose. And the Lord said unto Noah, the daughters of thy sons have sold themselves for behold, mine anger is kindled against the sons of men for they will not hearken to my voice. And it came to pass that Noah prophesied and taught the things of God, even as, as it was in the beginning. So this from the book of Moses, this is radically different. Um, and it really clarifies what is happening here. It clarifies what's happening here. Um, in fact, it seems kind of devious that somebody did something to the scriptures where they reversed it, where it's like, oh yeah, the sons of God, they were the one ones that were going after the women. Uh, when in reality, the sons of God were being sons of God and men of the world were going after the daughters of the sons of God. So, okay, so let's see. Um... Because the daughters of Noah married the sons of men, contrary to the teachings of the Lord, his anger was kindled, and this offense was one cause that brought to pass the universal flood. You will see that the condition appears reversed in the book of Moses. It was the daughters of the sons of God who were marrying the sons of men, which was displeasing unto the Lord. The fact was, as we see it revealed, that the daughters who had been born evidently under the covenant and were the daughters of the sons of God, that is to say, those who held the priesthood, were transgressing the commandment of the Lord and were marrying out of the church. Thus they were cutting themselves off from the blessings of the priesthood contrary to the teachings of Noah and the will of God. That's from Answers to the Gospel. Um, President Spencer W. Kimball warned Latter-day Saints today of the dangers of marrying outside of the covenant. Quote, Paul told the Corinthians... Be, be ye not unequally yoked together. Perhaps Paul wanted them to see that religious differences or religious differences are fundamental differences. Religious differences imply wider areas of conflict. Church loyalties and family loyalties clash. The children's lives are often frustrated. The non-member may be equally brilliant, well-trained, and attractive, and he or she may have the most pleasing personality, but without a common faith, trouble lies ahead for the marriage. There are some exceptions, but the rule is harsh and is a harsh and unhappy one. There is no bias nor prejudice in this doctrine. It is a matter of following a certain program to reach a definite goal. That's from the miracle of forgiveness. And we know what that goal is. Our, our purpose is to become um, like our Heavenly Father. We are the sons and daughters of God. We are the same species. The way that other churches view it is we are creatures. But in our church, we know that we are the same species as God. Now, <clears throat> only those that prove themselves worthy will be able to receive exaltation and be able to have spirit children themselves once they inherit all that the Father hath. But because it's so much power so much power. Not just anybody can procreate uh, after this life. Here on earth, this is designed to be a test. It's a, it's a place where we prove ourselves and anybody can have a child. Just any old person without any responsibility could have a child. And you hear horror stories of just all sorts of parents that obviously do not deserve to be parents. In this life, they do, because Heavenly Father granted that to them in this life. But this is a life where we show them this is how we treat the life that we create. Are you going to take care of your children? Are you going to teach them and help them reach the same standing as yourself? Or are you going to be abusive? Are you going to um, be indifferent to that child? So it's important to marry inside the covenant because 
that's how you continue after this life having an eternal family and doing what our Heavenly Father is doing. You can't do that with somebody that doesn't qualify for exaltation. Okay, moving on. Okay, there's nothing else there. Um, <clears throat> let's read just a few more things. Okay, that was that. That was it for the Book of Enoch. And then I have this Britannica article about the Nephilim. There was something here I wanted to read under um, interpretations. Given the ambiguity of the Genesis passage, there are several interpretations about the relationship between the quote-unquote sons of God and the Nephilim. Some have understood the sons of God to be fallen angels, and the Nephilim are the offspring they produce with human women. <clears throat> this view was described in the first book of Enoch, a non-canonical Jewish text, and remains a popular explanation. The first book of Enoch also notes that the Nephilim were giants, which seemed in accordance with the quote-unquote quote unquote, people of the great size, or people of great size, described in the Numbers passage. The apparent gigantism of the Nephilim is argued to stem from their supernatural origin, though some have countered that countered that it is theologically problematic to suggest that angels or demons as purely spiritual beings could physically reproduce with humans. Okay, so I guess I guess it depends on your your church, your religion and how they view I guess maybe some churches they view view angels as purely uh, spiritual, and the same with demons. A less supernatural view holds that the Nephilim were simply men who fell away from righteousness. Uh, now see, that makes a lot more sense. Specifically, some theologians have held that, quote, the sons of God is a reference to the descendants of Seth, the righteous son of Adam, and that the Nephilim were members of his bloodline who rejected God. This view, known as the Sethian view, uh, was held by St. Augustine and other church fathers as well as many Jewish theologians. The Sethian view is sometimes elaborated with the assertion that the quote-unquote daughters of men were the ungodly women of the bloodline of Cain, Adam's murderous son. With the Nephilim as mere humans, their quote-unquote great size is variously taken literally or metaphorically though they were undoubtedly considered great warriors. And um, that seems to be more in line with the way that our church would view this based on the, the seminary manuals. Um, so the thing about it, you guys, I feel like... Um, I feel like when, when you come across things in the gospel that seem science fictiony, right? Like something out of a science fiction show or story. It's usually not really the case. Usually. Now, we know that there are miracles that happen. Incredible miracles, but um I've noticed a tendency to kind of like kind of go to the extreme when it comes to uh, the spectacular way of viewing the scriptures like spectacularism. So someone that's more prone to spectacularism, and I'm not saying this against anybody. Um, so there, there's like a whole spectrum of people that view the scriptures in different ways. But um, I guess what I found is that whenever there's, there's something that seems like more on like the science fiction side, uh, it, that's usually not the case when you, when you study the church literature. And this, this is this is an example of that. Um, so I, I didn't even know until now that uh, the Book of Moses talks about this problem or talks about this issue. Um, I had no idea. And, and this is the importance of doing personal study um, when something kind of stands out. Because when you come across like foreign concepts like that, because like no one in our church has ever talked about Nephilim or um, the Watchers. So when you hear that, and it's starting to get popular among people in the church, 
I, I think what you should do is you should stop and be like, okay, wait, that has never been taught in church. Um, I'm not just going to outright discredit it, but I need to find out for myself. I need to get to the source. And uh, th in this case, this is what happened. We were, well, I when I was preparing for this video, I was directed to, well, I started off like I usually do with um, the Institute manuals, but I also looked at Mormon doctrine, looked at Bible dictionary, and um, was referred to the Book of Moses. And in, in the Book of Moses, it, it clears it up. It explains what what the sons of God are. Um, and the problem, it was a it was an intermarriage problem. People of the covenant marrying with uh, worldly people. Um, let's see if there was anything else. Uh, the term Nephilim also shows up here. Numbers uh, 13, 23. Wait, no. <laughs> Numbers chapter, chapters 13. Okay, whatever. Here you go. Look, the spies, you'll remember this. Okay, sending spies into the promised land as Israel was getting ready to occupy the land, um, to conquer it. Yet the spies, ex uh, except for Joshua and Caleb, reported that despite the richness of the land, there was no hope for driving out the inhabitants. The exaggerated tone of their negative report shows in the use of such words as uh, quote unquote, very great. Uh, the land, quote unquote, eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Uh, all, all the people are men of great stature. Uh, we saw the giants. Uh, we were as grasshoppers. Such an exaggerated report of itself was bad enough and demonstrated the lack of faith of the 10 men who gave it. But the national tragedy began when Israel hearkened to their report. So in this case, um, I mean, I don't know what was actually going on here. I don't know if they identified them as uh, Nephilim, because if there was a literal aspect to it, like so, so we know that it's not a result of um, Satan and his followers interbreeding with humans that's not possible but you know was there like a bloodline was there genetic traits among the worldly where they were taller bigger um, and so that's how they were identified as nephilim and then after the flood you you still had them um maybe pop back up you know because I, I think what I've heard is that, you know, you had the three sons of Noah and um, Ham had married someone that would have been um, his wife was like, uh, like worldly. You know, she would have she would have been like one of the daughters of one of the daughters of men, essentially. And so through her, the Nephilim bloodline continued. Um, probably have to research that some other time. So is what they were seeing here, were they recognizing the, the descendants of Ham? And they're like, oh, there's Nephilim over there. I don't know. I don't know. And then the other time that it's used is here in Ezekiel 32, but there's no, there's no interpretation here really of what's going on. And um, yeah, just, just that this is where there was another instance of Nephilim or giants being used in Ezekiel 32. So interesting stuff. Um, you know, so going back to the email, you know, I'm not trying to tell anybody what to think at all. And thank you, uh, Rebecca, for sending me the, the information. So I, I would tend to be, you know, skeptical that uh, fallen ones are coming back because uh, the fallen ones have been here since the beginning, and it's Satan and his followers. <clears throat> um, if we're talking about Nephilim, then 
it's not Nephilim in the sense that other churches believe, because that would require Satan and his followers to be able to interbreed with humanity, which we know that that's not possible or that's the case. So um, I don't, yeah, I don't think that fallen, one, fallen ones are coming back. As far as the Euphrates River drying up, I think that that could be significant. I think that could be a literal sign um, of where we're at when it comes to the book of Revelation. We'll just have to wait and see. As far as the noises go, uh, that's even murkier. I, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't tend to think that those are um, Satan and his followers. Um, it could be, uh, for all I know, but... Uh, I would just tend probably not to think so. So I don't mean to be a buzzkill or um, be a bummer um, about this, but that's the, that's the conclusion that I come to you based on this information. But um, if you guys have any additional information that would support some other view, feel free to share that with me. Uh, but that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video. If you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.